Hey, everybody, welcome back. It's been a few weeks, but Robert and I are back to Matrix Mash once again. Robert, buddy, good to see you. Hey, Emily, it's great to see you again, even though I think I saw you, what, about two weeks ago? A yeah. week and a half ago? And we had dinner together, and it was great. Great fun with you and Laura and Jeff Gates and uh, Joan. It was, it was really great to hang out with you in person. And we didn't get to spend a lot of time together at our events. It was kind of a nice cap, and, and here we are. And now you've got a plant grain out of your head. This is a really I fascinating I, I, I change. Do. I, I, actually, I think I was sitting here the last time we did a Matrix Mash, but maybe you just didn't know. I had a light back there, too, but the light's in the front here now because it's too dark. So I need to. Make I, I like the background, and the plant has kind of like a Christ-like pose to it too. You know, I'm nothing if not Christ-like. We all know this. You know? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Robert, I just want to congratulate you again on, on a great event. I think that for your first event, especially that one, as well as anyone could get hope for, and you have gathered a bunch of really nice people around your community of listeners, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know, I'm really looking forward to the next time we roll this out, and. It may be perhaps more successful from a like a business standpoint for me, yeah. but it will it will it's going to have to go a long ways to top the personal kind of success that myself and a lot of other people experience. So, and then, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Myself as well. I hope to be involved again. So, thank you. Yeah, for absolutely. Me. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right, we have we are on a hard out today, so let's get right into business. And if, if anything that we do here could be considered business, um, but <laughs> anyway, so uh, what terrifying story do you have for me today? This is Halloween. Well, I, yeah, it's Halloween, and uh, I, you know, I I just did my my show just a few minutes before we started our show, and one of the themes that I was working on, but I didn't quite get to until the end of the show, was that every day is Halloween now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a phrase that um, Paul Joseph Watts and other people uh, use. Uh, it's called clown world. Mm-hmm. You know, we're living in clown world now. And if you think of a clown, a clown uh, wears a mask and makeup and it takes on a different persona and a different identity. So if we're living in clown world, then every day really is Halloween, especially if it's upside down and inverted when we're living in, for the most part, in an inverted universe. And I began to think about things like Drag Queen Story Hour, which is prevalent. If you look at the drag queens, they are in costume, right? Yep. And sometimes the costumes are very terrifying. And yet they're put into a situation where they are reading um, fairy tales and reading other, other stories that are either traditional fairy tales or some kind of, you know, new trans fairy tale. Let me show you uh, some of these images from uh, some of the drag queen story hour, just so that people can wrap their heads around what some of the, what some of these people um, look like and some of the guises that they take on. Um, while I'm doing that, maybe you want to chime in and give some some perspective on this. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite researchers used to do an occasional show. Uh, Dave McGowan used to do an occasional show with Maria Heller called Send In the Clowns. And I think the clowns are all in now. I don't think there's any more to send in. <laughs> I think the clowns are all in here. We see them every day. We were actually joking about that last night. Is it send in the clowns or send in the clones? Because we have clown clones too. So maybe there are more clowns to be sent in. But yeah, I think, you know, where this started, this being in costume every Every day and think really with the rise of Burning Man. Um, I, you know, as Burning as Burning Man became more popular, and I think it hit its crescendo. You know, around I mean, it's been popular since the '90s, but I'd say it hit its peak of popularity. I mean, it continues to grow, but its peak of like having its maximum influence somewhere around 2010, 2011 or whatever, and I was living downtown, and I, a lot of people who are part of the Burning Man crowd in Los Angeles live downtown, and they'd be wandering around in pirates' outfits and in, you know, outfits with tall top hats and suspenders, things, you know, just like we were at the circus, you know? It wasn't quite garish like, like drag queen, but it made it very hip and very trendy to be dressed up as somebody other than who you normally present as. 
it made it very edgy. And I think that they really do experiment at Burning Man with where they want to take things. And one of the big shifts that's happened at Burning Man in the last several years is this idea that there's no genders. In fact, it's part of the questionnaire for the people's experience at Burning mm -hmm. Man, how they identify, why they identify, or they identify 50% or more this way or that that they do. They're really trying to play around with the gender in the way that it, it, it relates both to technology and art. And they're coming at it from that that direction. And I think that's where these things all kind of come together around things like drag queens and, and you know what I mean? And, and whatnot. They look like garish Technicolor dream coat kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Bernie man is kind of like the Weimar Republic relocated <laughs> in, you know, in the black rock desert of Nevada and, yeah. and, and dressed up with, um, you know, steampunk fashion. Right. I mean, it's <laughs> sort of, and I've been, I've been to Bernie man. I've, I've, I've been twice and, the first time I went to Burning Man, there were about um, there were about thirty five hundred, four thousand people there, and now you know it's a small it's a small city. It's, it, it gets to about forty five, fifty thousand people, and um, yeah, it, and it really morphed into something um, very very different. And I was around in San Francisco when they had the first Burning Man on the beach yeah. uh, in San Francisco, and I was working at a magazine, and one of the guys that was at the magazine who was actually kind of, I think, descended from British royalty. He wasn't even working. He was interning there. His name was Patrick. He was an interesting guy. We hung out, and um, we, we had some good old American fun. Anyway, he was down at the beach one day, and this is when Larry uh, burned the first Wicker Man effigy. And they actually had it on the beach, for I think, for two years. And and he and the beach is run by the Park Service, Yeah, which, are, which is the same – entity that runs the black rock desert and so they said well you you can't do this here so well where could i do it and they said well, we, you know we got this big patch of land um out in nevada maybe you can do it there so a that's big, a big patch of land out in the desert with a base underneath it so we can conduct westworld and call it burning man <laughs> yeah you know that whole pyramid lake area is really bizarre it is so oh, here in California. Yeah. I, I, well, Pyramid Lake, you get to, you go past Pyramid Lake on the way to, on the way to Burning Man. Yeah. Right? I, there, there was a, uh, so I have a story. So I, we used to go to Pyramid Lake sometimes when I was little and I had a, I got a concussion there kind of one time and I definitely put, you know, like lost some time. The sort of, uh, I was water skiing and the board, uh, not water skiing, uh, boarding like waterboarding right? yeah. I was waterboarding and it slipped out from underneath me and came out and knocked me in the face you know and then I don't really know what happened after that but there there's a this is so interesting because it's Halloween and oh everything's coming full circle there's this okay so there was supposed to be this party that was like sounded amazing to me at burning at, at Pyramid Lake like this was probably five seven seven not seven years ago right and it, it is kind of interesting the guy who was kind of involved in throwing the party was this DJ named Mr. C, who actually lives here in Los Angeles. He's a long, he's been around forever. He's from the underground in London. He's part of that sort of tech house kind of- I know stuff. Mr. C, yeah. Yeah, his music is great. He also goes by The Shaman. That used to be a name he went Right, by. right, Move uh, Any Mountain. I love that but, song. Yeah, but he's, um, he's an interesting character. And yep. he definitely is, whether he realizes it or not, of that created culture, all of Tavistock, right? You know, right, yeah, yeah, and yeah. He lives here in Los Angeles at least part time now, and he he throws parties and stuff still. And the music is always great, but there's definitely always been that edge to it of gender bending. You know what I mean? Right. A, a, a yeah. Gender bending kind of thing, garish costumes, weirdness just for the sake of being weird, all of that right. kind of stuff. And the, the party, it was going to be a huge party. It ended up getting canceled. I had been looking forward to kind of going to it because it was like, oh, sort of like Burning Man without having to go to Burning Man. But that right. weird, like is really weird. I'm curious about the ley lines or the geometry, the geometry that is created between Pyramid Lake Black Rock Desert, but then also the Giza platform. Like, what kind of geometry is created if you draw lines between those things and mm -hmm. how they, you know, set that up? So I've never been to a party there at Pyramid Lake, but it's interesting that you that you bring that up. And this talk that we're having, I'd say one of the DJ, one of the people in the dance music scene that most matches what we're talking about is Mr. C. Mm. Well, I yeah. So on my way to Burning Man one time, my car broke down, and it, I broke down right near Pyramid Lake. Yeah. And um, so uh, we got picked up by 
uh, this young guy who had a tow truck and brought brought my car into was it w the next town over um, anyway um, it'd be like Gorman uh, I think so I think that might be it either Gorman so, on one side or like El Tejon on the other side I think it be yeah, so Fraser he Park brought, area. So he brought he brought us back and this is in Nevada now, right? We're in Nevada side, right? Pyramid okay. Lake. We're in the Nevada side of Pyramid Lake. And he told he told us about all the strange shit that goes on there. Because he's been there, lived there most of his life. And he said, Yeah, I've I've seen I've seen these massive triangles come out of the lake. Uh -huh. The pyramids, like flying pyramids come out of the lake. And and then there's a lot of, you know, uh Native American Lore, a lot, a lot of supernatural stuff. So the area in and of itself is pretty unusual where Burning Man takes place. So, um, yeah, yeah, that was that was a, that was an interesting time in my life. You know, this whole thing around the gender bending and, and the switch. One of the things that uh, that that is the uh, com it's, it's not a common refrain, but this is sort of the the narrative that's coming out of that world is that. Um, that the trans experience is a shamanic experience mm -hmm. and that, and that David Bowie actually was one of the first people to talk about this mm -hmm. and that he, when he was going through the whole gender bender scene and was wearing dresses and makeup, you know, he was very articulate in saying that, that uh, the shaman was an outcast from the rest of the tribe because in many instances, the shamans, this goes back to the shaman, which we were talking about the group, right? Mm -hmm. The shaman were gay. Or if they weren't gay, they were different in a particular kind of way. Like maybe they may have exhibited some form of hermaphrodi hermaphrodism, or maybe they had one eye that was looking one way and one eye looking. They, they were separated out. Yeah. And, and so Bowie sort of took this as um, – um, kind of an, uh, a, a a cultural touch point to sanctify uh, cross dressing, mm -hmm. right? That cr by being a cross dresser, you're essentially playing the role of the shaman because you're outside of the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is a narrative now that has been picked up by the trans and the drag community. Yeah, this is the distortion that I've been talking about for a long time in that, like, one of the reasons the shaman is gifted with some of the powers uh, that they have is that they have a unique inner balance of male and female, prince like, you know, characteristics or polarities, right? And that, that does give ride, rise to a very high spiritual place. But what's happening is people are being told to... to with this whole trans thing is they know that this sort of wave and energy of change where people are starting to try and become more balanced in themselves is, is happening. You know, I don't know if it's a naturally or it's where we're going. And in order to distort that, they're turning it into an outer thing. This balance right. of male and female should be inner. And it really brings you into a higher, higher spiritual state or a more knowing state. And they're do so they're, they're doing two things with it. They're turning it into an outer thing expression. They're like, oh, I have to change my appearance. I have to look garish and stuff like that. And they're also turning it into a technology thing because technology is also androgynous largely, right? Like, so they're, they're, it's pushing us both towards transgenderism and transhumanism instead of it being an inner process where the person becomes balanced in themselves, balanced in their, their feeling and their knowing, their you know, kind of thing, right? Their logical brain and their sensing brain. That's the natural thing that I think is supposed to be happening, but humans have this desire, this, this tendency to externalize everything and the people that control humans know that. And that I can't think of a better example of how they're manipulating and pulling people around and really destroying what could be a beautiful time for humanity in terms of the way people are changing by making it into this. Right. So, um, you know, you're preaching to the choir here and I, and I talked about this last Friday on my show. And um, one of the things that, I, I, I talked about was that um, uh, in our group, in our, in our little three-day experience, right, which was about 60, 40, 60, I'd say female to male 40, mm -hmm. that, that you had women that were really strong, independent, smart, soulful women, but not at the expense of being a woman. 
Right. And then you had men who were, I, I thought, really masculine guys mm -hmm. without the, you know, sacrificing their masculinity. They had the, the qualities of being sensitive, empathic, uh, kind, but you know, there wasn't any diminution mm -hmm. of one trait in favor of the other. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, we're at this point now after all this bullshit with uh, feminism and men sort of kowtowing and, you know, uh, maybe, you know, moving away from, like, like uh, Roosh is a really interesting example. Roosh V, who was a total, you know, borderline misogynist. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy, the guy is now, like, you know, he's like, no, I don't want these values to be associated with who I am and what I'm doing and what my work is. And he may be moving into maybe a bit of another extreme area, but he's trying to find some balance and some of that sacred kind of, uh, value that he is a man can ground and personify and we're going there we're heading there meanwhile they're hijacking the narrative they're jumping the shark and mm -hmm. we've got we've got the clown show now we've got the clown show yeah yeah so one of the unfortunate um effects of the fact that we have the clown show is, is the fact that the people on the receiving end of the drag queen story hour are children and this leads into i think what you wanted to talk about next because it's going on right at your home state of texas so yeah and, and, and um i started tracking the younger case you know right when i first heard about it which is probably about a month and a half ago maybe two months ago so when Jeffrey Younger is his name, right? Jeffrey Younger. Right, and, right. And, and he's, yeah. he's in court because his ex-wife is trying, is insists that they have twin sons, fraternal twins, and he insists that one, the wife insists that one of them is a girl and insists on calling her Luna and has socially transitioned the child already and is wanting to physically transition the child. And the husband is saying, the ex -husband, Jeffrey Younger is saying no. And and the, this is a court battle that's going on between them. That's do I have that all correct? Yeah. So that's okay. that's what's happening, and um, you know he has gone to the court of public opinion, and and the judge in the case, Kim Cooks, has now slapped him with a gag order, so he can no longer talk about the case. Um, I did hear the that initially, like you know, they they went ahead and awarded full custody to the wife, but just and they did, but the, just the other day, I did hear that it, I heard a lot of stuff about the gag order, but what there wasn't a lot of reporting on. But what I did hear from Life, Life News, which is um, a conservative Christian news source, but they they were there and they were interviewing people that the the uh, in private in the closed court that the judge did actually say that they have 50-50 in terms of decision making and that the mother will not be allowed to make decisions about the child's physical or psychological health without the, the agreement or the input of the father. So that's good, but of course they're not publicizing that part of it. Well, um, yeah, it would be nice if we heard that. And theoretically, that's how it's supposed to work mm -hmm. in the state of Texas. doesn't always work that way, though. Yeah, the state of Texas is really... Uh, at war with men. It's I think pretty, so. It's pretty interesting because you, th if you had to pick other than maybe a, a state like Alaska or Wyoming or something like that, you really think of Texas as a more masculine state as, you know, as a little bit more of a traditional kind of, kind of state. And I understand that part of tradition is that the mother cares for the children, but part of the tradition is also is that a man is on a certain level head of the household and makes decisions and whatnot. And so this is, I mean, I don't know if this is part of the blue wave that they're forcing on Texas, or if this is just part of like, I sent you a video, what James Younger was talking about, about that the state actually gets more money for separating the children from one of the parents and making the other parent the full custody parent. And then since in tradition, that would be the mother, that's what's happening. Is that what's happening? I mean, I know you're experiencing some of this yourself from the inside. What is it? What, what do you know about this stuff? Well, so my... My experience is that um, that a lot of it is, to, to some extent, I won't say a lot, but, but I would say that um, a fair share of this is determined by where you're living in Texas as well. But there generally tends to be kind of, well, the, the laws themselves are, are unified or they're universal and applied across the state. That said, 
there are um, certain counties that will interpret them differently. Like, for instance, I live in Gillespie County, and I was told that what uh, what I might be experiencing in Austin would be interpreted differently in Gillespie County because there is a different kind of locus mm -hmm. of mm, identity and 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 even to some extent judicial power and judicial interpretation. Now that said, my feeling about the state of Texas, and this would probably apply to many states, is that in the state of Texas, um, the Freemasons have a tremendous yes. uh, foothold in terms of judiciary and law. Yeah. And, and here in Fredericksburg, where I live, they're, they're a significant form. And not only are they significant in terms of their Freemasonic uh, brethren and lodge, but they also extend into the Texas Rangers, which are another yes. group. Um, and you, if you, you can go to the Texas Rangers um, Museum here in Texas, right just down the road from where I live, and it is rife with Freemasonic goodies that you can buy. So if you understand what happens to a lot of people inside of Freemasonry, the thing that, that really takes place is that the family is, is shattered in a lot of ways. So the man is taken out of the home, and what becomes important is the fraternity and his relationship with his brethren, his lodge brothers. And you can go online and you can look at the laments of Freemasonic wives and wives that have that have suffered from losing their husbands to Freemasonry. And the consistent theme is they spend more and more time away from home, and then they wind up invariably finding like books of matches with you know with hookers names or escorts names in there. Because that's what happens is that the that the Freemasons ultimately and especially when you get into um the uh I always forget their name, the Shriners. Um, they're really into lasciviousness. So it's kind of interesting. It sounds pretty similar in some ways to what happens with, um, historically, unfortunately, in this country, with low-income black families, where the man comes out of the home and, it, it, you know, where the, there's an incentive, and, and now it's incentivized by the government, right? The same way that we're talking about, almost in this case, with, with the custody battles, where the man is out of the home, the woman is with, the, the baby mama is home with the kids, and the man is out doing gang stuff and getting involved in drugs and crime and hookers and stuff. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, the way it's out pictured and the, the places that it takes place is very different for a Freemason than for a gang member, but essentially the process is the same. The initiation is the same process. Completely well, if you, if you look, if you, yeah, if you look into the roots of the bloods and the crypts, um, they have, they have, they're tied into Freemasonry and lodges. Yeah. yeah. They, they totally are. And you've got the blue and the red and the blue and the red and that, you know, we're also see the, the blue way. and the red. Yeah, the blue, the blue and the red is all the you know, red way, blue way. I mean, it's yeah. the bloods and the crypts. I mean, it's the same kind of, you know, kind of model in some ways. And, and my feeling is, is that if it's true, what I'm talking about, and there is, and maybe, and let's say there are Freemasons out there who are, you know, loving and, uh, law-abiding husbands and Christians, and they don't they don't get into this. Maybe that's true. I, I you know, I'm, free, the lower level Freemasons who just want to be involved in the community and that kind of stuff, right? But based on what I've read, there's a pretty consistent theme here that this is what happens to the men, and then what happens is that the woman is then asked to join in and be a participant in what goes on with the men on some level, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's wife swapping polyamory group sex you know i'm sure that 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 occurs right mm -hmm. but and some women will do that and some will find an aberrant and they signed up for a certain thing they wanted the family and this is what they got and that's not what they signed up for right. so the family gets atomized yeah so what happens in the court system the families get atomized so it's the same thing mm -hmm. but it's happening so the court system is social freemasonry that's what I believe. Okay. That's what I believe. And so, so if indeed that's the case in what happens in 
the private lives of the Freemasons, but and I'm not saying all of them. I'm saying that the you know that yeah. this is what I've read online. And I'm not saying anything that I I'm not. I'm just sharing with you that from the from the first first hand account of wives, this is what they've said. Yeah. And if that's the case, then maybe there's this transposition that's happening. Now the other thing too, at a, at a higher level, right? The other thing too is that there is some kind of distorted version of goddess worship going on as well. And that the woman is venerated as some form of goddess mm -hmm. and that there's a hierarchical relationship between the woman and the man. And then there's this disempowerment theoretically. Now the state of Texas will always say, uh, um, well, this is, you know, for just to make sure that the woman can take care of herself and, you know, she's, she's, um, but what uh, it's really about is the women bossing the men around. Just like we're ultimate, ultimately out, out in social life here with the, with the, yeah. with, the, with the feminism and with someone like Hillary Clinton, it's all about the women taking power so they can boss the men around. Ultimately, I think yeah. that's how that's, and then you look at James Younger and he was at the effect of what his wife or ex-wife was wanting. And then that relationship, by the way, is kind of weird. I weird. mean, when you, when you listen to that relation with like what he taught, he's a very bright guy yeah, and pretty good at representing the facts, but you dig down a little bit. It's like, what's going on here between these two people? Mm -hmm. Like who, who were they when they met mm -hmm. and what kind of things drew them together? Mm -hmm. So when you tell, when you hear his story, you know, apparently he was in the army and he stood up for some guy a who guy. was yeah. a gay guy who was being uh, sent to the brig or whatever because he was gay. And he believed that it was a human rights yeah. uh, offense, and he wanted to stand up for that guy. Maybe that's true. And, and, if, he, and if that's what happened, he's right, yeah. Right. So, yeah. so then he talks about how her mother, Ann Gorgulis' mother, was a gay rights activist, mm -hmm. and that they actually agreed on a lot of things. I'm like, this is – there's some, and, and there's something there to, to their marriage partnership and connection that is you know, odd. And, and weren't the kid, one other thing, weren't those kids, weren't those kids um, ectopic or were they, I don't even think she had, I don't even think she carried those kids, right? So are you saying that you think maybe that this, that this is a staged plan here? I don't know if it is or not. I'm not. I'm not going to. When I listen to him talk here and, and watch him and look at his mannerisms and just his overall energy, Bill Ayers, and their relationship seems a lot like Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. Um, yeah, the thing is kind of the whole thing is kind of weird on some level, right? And I'm not saying that this is another kind of conspiracy that we're being pulled into. Um, because I do think that the issue itself is an important issue, uh, and that children, you know, should not be should not have their their identities hijacked like this. No, uh, but I mean, think think about this though. Like, so let's just okay. Like, let's put on let let's have Emily's going to put on her tinfoil hat here, and yeah. off we go. So okay, so let's say that he was really an idealistic young man who did exactly what he said. And her mother is one of those kinds of gay rights activists that is trying to use all the gay shit for political manipulation, not really about human rights, but to try and endorse some certain kind of political stance, right? Or some kind of mm -hmm. political control. So, you know, that he's kind of the target, right? And all along, I mean, maybe it wasn't so, so set out, but this was the whole point. Like her whole point was to make... Uh, gender something that people can cho choose and select right that a person will decide what they are it's not assigned by biology because you know people i mean you know people on the left people who are some of these certain kinds of activists don't like the idea that nature decides anything right they don't like that they want they want to be in they want to be in charge they want to pick they want to call them you know what i mean or at least when it comes to some of this gender stuff right and so this kid is her mother's daughter Right. And so she's playing this out. So whatever's happening, I mean, think about it. what's happening here is that the courts are now deciding what a child's gender is instead that's of right. just being obvious by looking at their body. Right. That's right? right. And so that's the right. whole yeah. point is to bring attention to this idea and whatever the outcome is, 
it's interjecting, injecting into the social consciousness the idea that gender is a legal matter and not a biological one. Right, and that's something that um, people are talking about, and yeah, and I touched on that a little bit. You're absolutely right. It's about the courts deciding who is who and what is what, and this leads us into the, another thing that we wanted to talk about, which is the next court rulings that are going to be based around transgender males participating in uh, female athletics, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's going to be, that's the next, that's the next legal battleground where this is going to take place. And I just wanted to, uh, I have a few visuals aside here. Um, this is a, this really shows the physical disparity. This is a Jesus women's rugby Christ. match. Look at this. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. Bone density, muscle mass. You know, there, there's a world of difference here. Did the, the, world the, of the, difference. The, the, the one on the right's body, you look, it's huge. It looks like Steve Merker, Mercer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like huge muscles, thick, strong, you know, strong guy. Uh, right, right. And, yeah. this, and here she is. This woman is about to be put into a world of hurt. Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let me show you. Let me show you another one. Oh Jesus! Look at that! Wow! And it's clear that this dude that is way in front. Man. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, I got one more for you. All right. This is a male weightlifter who's um, setting all kinds of records now. As a woman. As a woman, right. So, so <laughs> that, like, guys who would be considered doughy, out-of-shape men can just switch over to the, women, to the women's uh, weightlifting. Well, as, 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 as a power weightlifting champion. <laughs> well, well that, that's the build of a power lifter. I know, they, I know, Yeah, I know. right. But, yeah, I mean, but as a power lifter, he would probably be, you know, a second or third tier power lifter. Yeah. In in the men's world, mm -hmm. in the women's world, he can dominate, and 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 it's like, in a weird way, the the again since every day is Halloween, right? Every day is Halloween. The these are the ghosts and the demons that have been unleashed by third and fourth wave feminism. Like they're coming back now. Mm -hmm. They're coming back to 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 haunt the kind of ideology mm -hmm. that is embraced and disenfranchised men at a certain level, mm -hmm. right? So now they get to deal with it. And what was interesting was before today's show that I did earlier with, on my show, I did a search on some of these cases. And when you go into Google, what you'll find is you'll find propaganda. Mm -hmm. The first search results That's all will you be, find on any topic now. You can't find any of the stuff. Any of the articles no. I know used to be there about any topic. I've been trying to like – show some people some things and you, I mean, I'd have to go 30, 50 pages deep to find the original articles that talked about this, that it's were gone. conspiratorial it's in gone now. Yeah. It's gone now. It's all about, you know, the, the you know, five myths of transgender yes. athletes dispelled. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, here we go. The machinery's in place. I think this is part of, place. so this is, do you know who Kalindi is? I've heard the name. Kalindi's the guy who eats like 30 grams of mushrooms at a time. And oh, yeah, you told me about this guy, yeah. yeah. Okay. So he talks, I was, he was talking with Sonia one time, and he was talking, and I think he understands some of this because he's, you know, a really good psychonaut, and so he's able to see in that realm what's coming here. He's like, the tr like transhumanism is like, it's not just going to be about merging with machines. He's like, we're going to start seeing people with tails and manes Absolutely. and things like that. Absolutely. People are going to yeah. be all manner of like hybrids of animals and plants and this and that. Like, I'm really going to have the plant growing out of my head and I'm going to insist people tell me I'm a tree. Like, you know what I mean? Like all this kind of stuff. And that this is sort of, um, what you're talking about, right? Like it's like, that's what the, that's what the X-Men have been about. Yeah, that's what the X Men up, but it's also this thing of it's it's this kind of witchcraft or magic where it's like I'm what I say I am, not what I really am, right? Right. And and, right. and, and this whole um, but what I think this is 
part of this is about is getting people to, in some ways, to diminish or lower themselves. They think they're raising themselves into some kind of gods or something by doing this, but it's actually a way of the, um, the uh, things that are not human being able to better blend in. The, th the things that are not human that are sort of running our reality, right, are turning into everybody, every, trying to turn everybody into a similar kind of creature that they are. Right. 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 It, it, it's like the bar is lowered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The bar is really lowered. And, and again, this gets back to what you were talking about, which is how we don't need the outward. We don't need the makeup. We don't need the transmogrification of our sexes to come into balance. Right. Just like we don't need to have these fake low bar superpowers to determine and define who we are because what we're really capable of is way beyond that way beyond that but they want us to accept like they want us to accept um lesser magic right it, 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 you know because it, see, it, they've told us we don't have greater magic but guess what we'll give you lesser magic and that'll be more than you have and that keeps us from just being that keeps people satisfied with well now i i, I got to, i always wanted to be a, you know a unicorn and so now i am so i have some magic when really you know the the, the possibilities are much greater but once you've gone about adjusting your hormones like just like changing your hormones unnaturally is like being programmed. It's just like being under sure. my control. It's a program. You've changed your chemical makeup. You've changed your role in the game or whatever. And you, you know, you now have less possibilities, really not more. Mm -hmm. you shut right. down some things, especially. Absolutely. If yeah, absolutely. Less, not more. And then that's the trick, right? That is the con mm -hmm. game. Yep. The lesser man. That's that you're spot on with that. Totally spot on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've had we've had a good decades worth of programming, from Harry Potter to yeah. the X Men to the and the X Men is is a real, it's a real cultural um, transformer, but not necessarily in a good way, right? I mean, it's it's like you're mutant if you're mutant, you're special, and you know what what is it what has it brought us? It's brought us Greta Thunberg, you know who's <laughs> who's a mutant. Oh. Right, she's a mutant. She's yeah. got superpowers because she's got Asperger's. Right. You know, she she she, she could be in there with, um, you know, Medusa and uh, and Cyclops and all the other X Men. Yeah, you did. Robert did a um, a great uh, impression of Greta Thunberg at his conference. <laughs> you look really nice with long braids, Robert. <laughs> See, you too could be a sixteen year old girl. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. The, the Greta Thunberg thing is, I mean, disturbing on many levels and beyond belief, but it's also part of this, the women bossing the men around. It's the children bossing the adults around. Right? Oh, the, that's the piece. Yeah. It's the, the, chi the, the child now is the warden of mm -hmm. the home. Wasn't that exactly a scene, a, a part of 1984, though you get to a place where the children are telling the parents what to do? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And it's happening. Yeah, and I have to say, did you see that video that uh, Henrik did about Greta Thunberg? It was they took uh, it got his channel deleted from YouTube. That's all right. Yeah, all the white supremacist stuff did never get his channel uh, deleted from from YouTube, but the Greta Thunberg thing did, and the Greta Thunberg video was actually spot on, amazingly well researched. And I was like, oh, it's the old Henrik that we know. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Still deleted. He is so much more dangerous to the establishment when he's in himself and not in this. White, you know, this, you know, racial identity kind of thing. It was an amazing video. It was really well researched. She is completely a creation. She is a, she is a, like a, a, she's, I mean, definitely a prototype of some kind of transhumanism and she's acting out her program. Yeah, no doubt, without a doubt. And um, his interview with E. Michael Jones, which is the follow up. Did you see that one? I listened to a little bit of that, but. I find and I found the way e. Michael Jones was talking to be annoying, so I couldn't actually appreciate the content of it because he kept talking about mommy and Yoki and, and, and you know and being silly, kind of silly. So I could, right. I listened to about twenty minutes of it, and, and I, <laughs> you know I, I would rather have just listened to him. He and Henrik be a little bit more. Yeah, Henrik was fine, but like yeah, I found I found the way. He, E. Michael Jones was fra sort of framing the story to be annoying, but yes, it's exactly right though. His point is exactly right. Yeah. The, so the point he was making was that her, her mother, Greta's mother went off to be an opera star and a worldwide international uh, music star. She won the Eurovision song mm -hmm. contest and then she was out of the home 
and Greta through a hunger strike. It would not would not eat until her mother came back home. And so this is kind of, again, the child holding the parent hostage. Now, what's really interesting is that there is a version of that story that's a commercial now. And the commercial is with Kraft macaroni and cheese. Yeah. And if you, if you watch TV long enough to run into this commercial and the parents are serving up a really nice, wholesome, good, nutritious dinner, and the kid throws a shit fit. And won't eat the food. Oh, like and, then my the <laughs> and the mother goes and reaches for a box of cracked macaroni and cheese. Right. And now all of a sudden the kid is nice and everybody's happy and they're listening to uh, angels and harp strings. I, I, yeah, I, I, actually, to be fair, my, my nephew doesn't throw shit fits about dinner, but he, all he wants to eat is macaroni and cheese. You know, and ain't pretty much he'll eat macaroni and cheese and, um, yeah, pretty much mostly macaroni and cheese. They'll dip his lettuce in ranch dressing and suck it off, and that's about, <laughs> you know. But it is true. It, I mean, it's the same thing. Like, I mean, the kids these days are so uh, spoiled on a certain level, but also used to instant gratification, and that comes from technology because when you push a button and something happens, then you think that that's how the world works. And, yeah, like every the entire family, the entire – is held hostage until the kid gets what they want. And exactly. That is exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. The enfant terrible. You know, yeah. this is what this is what we've bred, and uh, yeah, wow. And and just just like the last couple of days, um, this story broke with Josh Hamilton, who was um, an outfielder, played for the Texas Rangers. Oh, let's hear. I, I mean, I knew. That, I, I mean, I know he was the one. All I know about him is he was a terribly troubled but incredibly talented player who kept having issues with drugs. But then he'd show up and play well for a year or two, and then he'd have problems again. And he's been back and forth amongst a num number of different teams, but always seems to end up back in Texas. What happened now? So Josh Hamilton backstory: He was, I think, one of the first or second players chosen in the amateur baseball draft. A Roy Hobbs-like player, the natural, right? Big, strong, yeah. fast, could do everything. And he was drafted um, by, I think it was Tampa, and he uh, was a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. And um, he washed out, and he wound up with Cincinnati, and he played well at Cincinnati for a while. And Cincinnati is a big crime city, mm -hmm. and he got hooked back into heroin in Cincinnati, and then he got clean, and then he went to Texas, and he mm -hmm. played for the Rangers, and he did great. Yep. He was an MVP. And he's from um, Texas, right? So Texas is home uh, No, I think I think Josh is from Florida. I think he's oh, from he, okay. I'd have to check I'd have to double check on this. But he goes to the Rangers. He does incredibly well. Um and he becomes a Christian, you know, which is what somebody in recovery does and nothing nothing wrong with that. But there's this weird thing that happens to him when he it, it, this was I think right after his peak. And it was at a Rangers game, and um, sometimes when a ball goes foul, uh, the player will throw it into the stands. Mm -hmm. And Josh Hamilton threw a ball from the outfield into the upper deck, and the dad reached out. Uh, dad reached out and got the ball, but he fell off the upper deck and right. he got, inju got injured, which was kind of weird because he was okay when he was – on his way to the hospital, but then he dies in the hospital. So now Josh Hamilton, this guy who's already on the edge, yeah, winds up witnessing the death of um, this kid's father. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I, I I remember this story vaguely, but I don't know the details about it. It was like a year or two ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's very sacrificial in some ways. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like the <laughs> weird thing that happened with Venus Williams in that car accident. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So. He wasn't really the same after that. And I remember taking my son to a playoff game against the – it was the final game of the season versus the Rangers. Uh, and it was in 2012. And Josh Hamilton just had a terrible series. He was playing center field. And I'm watching this play unfold, and the ball is – this is a rally. The A's are rallying, and the ball's hit to Josh Hamilton. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, he's going to drop this ball. And – Sure enough, he did, and then the A's rallied, and it was like he was on his way down. He was he was kind of you know going into goat status. 
mm-hmm. and and not not like greatest of all time, but goat horns. Mm-hmm. And then he, you know he he basically he said that he was trying to quit chewing tobacco during that series, and so he was having a really hard time. And I think he was in baseball for about another year or two after that. He was he was done. Oh, he's done and now. Just, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. But just recently, he was arrested because his daughter. He got into a fight with his daughter, mm-hmm. and his, his daughter was mouthing off to him, and he crossed some lines and shook her up. And I think he threw something at her. I mean, you know, I can only imagine the daughter was probably being a biatch, mm-hmm. right? And he, you know, he crossed lines. So he got arrested. He's looking at maybe doing 10 years in prison now. And I'm not saying that that I'm not advocating that behavior, but now kids know about CPS and, you know, and they can throw the hammer down. And just like what you were talking about with the courts, the state could come in Mm -hmm. and basically have these parameters of parenting. There are things that as a parent you cannot do. Yeah. You cannot do. And some of which is okay, which, and I think it's, you know, like, like I'm not a big spanking person. I don't think spanking solves anything. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, um, there has to be some, some real strong ways in which kids understand and know where their limits are. Yeah. And if they don't know where their limits are, then what we have now is we, we, we have a planet of Greta Thunbergs. We're basically telling us what to do. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, what, what was that, uh, what, what was that um, film that I am, I am, uh, that's like a Greek, a Greek, um, a Greek theme to it. It was a, uh, oh, where every person goes around saying they are this person. You know what I'm talking about? I am no. so, oh, it's, I, I almost want to say it was like a, it was like a film from like the 60s or 70s. I can't, I am so, I am, oh, I think Douglas was in it. I think Kirk Douglas, I am, oh, I can't think of it right now. But it's like literally everybody's going to be going around. I am Greta. That's going to be the next part. Oh, oh, is it I am Adrian Messenger? No, it's a Greek sounding thing. I am this person. It's a, like a, almost like a God sounding name. or, or Right, like but there, there is a film where, where it's like there are a bunch of people playing some this character named Adrian Messenger. Which right. they do, and Kirk Douglas is in that movie, by the way. Can you imagine, like, it, it, it'll become instead of like a yellow vest thing, everybody, everyone is Greta Thunberg. Everybody's running around in braids and looking. Oh, like, it's going to you know, happen. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's going to happen. No, so, 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 okay. So there is, uh, what is it? Um, oh, God. Uh, oh, the World According to Garp. Oh, that's one of my favorite books. That's a great book. I love that book. Right. So in The World According to Garp, um, there's the John, the character who's the trans, the transgender football player. Of course, yeah, yeah. Right, and then then there is the woman who is this mute woman who is like violated, and everybody like stops talking because of her, and yeah. they all become her. That's exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Aye. Interesting. Ah, all right. So we've whipped through a lot of stuff there, but it all yeah. Kind of on that yeah, sort of yeah. Got to that- got to go. A little bit of closure. All right. A little bit of closure. Um, if if we're living in Halloween and you have to wear a mask, wear your best mask. Wear your best right. mask and, and don't eat yeah. the sugar because it's programmable matter. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't Stay away the from the candy. Take, don't take the candy. It is interesting that on the night that people, there's, all, you know, the, that all these spirits are around and people are in their scary masks, that's when you fill people up with sugar, right? Like, Right. It, it's absolutely, it's a really great point. It's like, yeah, let's have all the sugar and, you know, let's just let's op- op- open up those gateways and let's start yeah. reprogramming people. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. A real fun, real quick. Another um, odd and unusual commercial. Well, funny, unusual, odd, maybe not. But there's a commercial making the rounds now with Hershey, mm-hmm. and the social programming is everywhere in commercials, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I want to do a video on this because boys are disappearing from commercials. Yeah, and whenever you see a family, it's a family with two girls or one girl. It's like, where are the freaking boys? They're, they're gone. They're disappearing. But this one commercial does have some boys. It's a Hershey's commercial. And essentially what it is, it's two girls 
And then one boy, the boy happens to be African-American, so-called black boy, right? And then they are negotiating with three other boys. And the girl, who is the tallest in the bunch, holds a big Hershey bar. And what she's doing is she's taking almost all the stash from the three little boys who are negotiating for this candy exchange in favor of one Hershey bar, right? right? So the two women, and of course their accomplice, who is a young black male, they're the ones that are holding these other kids hostage, these yeah. three boys. And we're going to take all your freaking candy, and eh, we'll give you a Hershey bar, right? Wow. It's also really interesting, too, that the Nick Sandman case is coming back during yeah. Halloween. Yeah. And, of course, Sandman is a comic book character. Yeah. And puts people to sleep, right? Yeah. So just We've more, talked more. That. We, we talked about that before, the Sandman putting, yep, 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 enter the Sandman it, kind of thing. Right, It right. is coming back. It is interesting. And, uh, yeah, well, I, we're, we're, we're headed into interesting times, my friend. <laughs> Absolutely. So just keep mashing that matrix. Keep mashing it. All right. You have a wonderful, I think you're going down to Kerrville for the vote. Yeah. Or something like that. No, no. What's today, uh, no, today okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm just working today. I went to Kerrville yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. Yeah. And was on uh, Hill Country Patriot Radio. Ooh. And, yeah. Uh, with, uh, with Matt Long. And uh, it was great. I mean, it, I mean, t it was, it was like um, one of those scenes where, I, you know, I've seen this place from the highway, never driven up, drove up. It's like this house on the way to Kerrville, just outside of Kerrville. And, and they've got a radio tower, radio station there. And inside the south, they got three or four radio stations. And they got a barbecue pit in the back. I'm like, this is cool. That is right? cool. <laughs> this, this is like, this is, this is my playhouse right here. This is where I want to live, right? That's cool, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we went in and we did the show and, it felt a little like pirate radio, you know, it felt like oh, that's, that's what we were cool. doing. That yeah. Fun. All yeah. Right. You, brought, you brought a little esoterica to the Patriots, huh? <laughs> nah, not so much. Not oh, so much. A little bit. Water. A little bit. You talked about fluoride. Talk, talked about water, you know, and I talked yeah. about how fluoridation is, is chemical colonialism. That's my I, new. I loved your thing on your show yesterday where you talked about the Latin kids getting their teeth colonized. Oh, it's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> colonization of the team like you guys if you don't watch robert's 15 minutes of flame it's informative but it's also actually hilarious it's like you know a, a genius insane man rambling to himself talking about the colonization of children's teeth i loved True. it it was amazing yeah, yeah it was yeah. amazing so yeah. cool what is it Lul all right lulax Lul lulac lulac and they were there they also pick up your ballots apparently that's right exactly <laughs> They're there to protect your teeth and pick up your ballots. <laughs> Guys, go watch his show yesterday. I think it was called Dead, Not Dead. What was it called? Dead Again. Dead, dead again. and Dead Again. Dead and yeah. Dead Again. Go check that one out. It's just it's great information and also just lots of laughs. So go to the bathroom before you watch it. All righty. We're signing off. We'll see you guys next time. You can find him at robertphoenix.com. You can find me on Facebook at Emily Moyer at Off Planet Radio. We'll see you next time. Bye.